So, hi and welcome back to the second episode of the Data Enrichment Podcast. Uh, in this pod, we're talking about adding data to marketing because data is really what powers digital marketing. And as it's, we're going through a huge technology shift, the data is actually becoming less and less. And that's why the value of adding data into marketing becomes higher and higher. And data is often uh, referred to as the digital gold, uh, but it's only gold if you know what you, to do with it. And in this pod, we will be talking about uh, explaining uh, some concepts about uh, looking at what's happening, what will be the impact, and of course, also looking at specific things that publishers, advertisers, and marketers in general can do uh, when it comes to data. Uh, in the last episode, uh, I talked about uh, first and third party uh, data and talking a little bit more about it. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this episode. So first third party data, first third party cookies and so on. Uh, what's actually the difference between first and third party data? And here, the biggest difference is that first party data is data that you control and own yourself. It's uh, data that you can actually store and crunch and do things with without involving someone else. Third party data is data that you can, uh, that's in, under the control of someone else, right? Uh, and that you might be able to get access to it's not but not necessarily control so and here are a few different levels i'll get into it uh, in a bit but if we look at examples of first party data uh, we can do kind of the most obvious ones uh, name address email phone number to one of your customers and i would say this is the most valuable data you can have this is really hard data that can, you can use to contact a specific customer. And linked to this uh, like relations data is of course uh, behavioral data, purchase data, transaction data, showing who the customer is and what uh, is it that they're buying from you. And this is of course uh, something that you can use in when you do email marketing, outbound sales, um, SMS, phone, this type of direct marketing uh, where you know what they bought from you before and then you can position relevant uh, additional offerings to the uh, same customer. And then you have other first party data. It can be your website traffic. Uh, this is your first party data, uh, kind of the user journey on the website, first party data. Uh, Referrals from external referrals, uh, which customers came from which marketing channel. This is data you actually can collect and, and control on your own domains. And this is also data that you can use to optimize your website, pers personalize, become more relevant for uh, the customers. And when it comes to first party data, what else is there? Of course, it's your business intelligence data. It can be, you know, seasonal data how what does the the season look like seasonality and so on the business intelligence that you know based on your sales and so on but it's very much data connected to um, to sales right and this is where uh, the biggest value i would say is from the first party data this is your data data you control and then we're talking about third party data, right? And, and here we the I would say that the the concept is is wider. There's a bigger array of uh, third party uh, data. Uh, but the most obvious ones is is I think data that that every uh, marketer is using and it would be search data from Google, um, audience data, lookalikes from from Facebook. This is data that is available in a third party channel, in a, a third party ecosystem, third party uh, platform, 
and here this data you you, you can't really access uh, and because you can only use it then and there for a few specific purposes but this is third-party data that you have access to third-party data that uh, you can use in your marketing and often what, what's been done with third-party cookies that we talked about in the last episode is that uh, you can match your own first-party data to this third-party data this means you know matching your website visitors to visitors on Facebook and so on and uh, this is of course really valuable if you want to kind of be able to match in in this way so but we're talking about third-party data that's under the control of someone else the use is limited uh, based on on uh, what offerings they have and, and how they limit you how you can use it uh, and other third-party data can be yeah it can be marked data uh, like um, statistics and so on available for a specific market uh, there are commercial um, marketing data uh, that you can use offline in a, a high degree like mosaic lifestyles for instance this is a market segmentation looking at the full population um, in a lot of different markets uh, this is data that's commercial uh, that you can buy and actually add to your own first party data and now we're coming into a different area so here we're talking about open data open to use if you pay for it of course uh, so you have third party data and through different variables like name address phone number email or different ways of matching you can actually take this third party data and add it to your own first party data and what you get then is actually more first party data you're adding on to your existing data layer and bringing it in under your control so that you can use it in yeah a, a, in the, the similar channels as you've done before but what's cool also with this type of data is that it's also data you can use to target your um, offline marketing your digital marketing to find new prospects so it's adding an addition, additional layer and this is what we're talking about when we're talking about data enrichment you're taking your data you're enriching it in different ways with more data and uh, this is really useful uh, especially when third-party data is getting more scarce and I would say that also the the, the third-party data that's been been available in in marketing uh, channels and and platforms and so on they are getting reduced in volume as they are not being able to collect as much data as as they were were able to uh, before but you can hear it right we're talking about statistical data we're talking about um, digital data uh, lookalikes market segmentations and so on and i think here it's really really important that we differentiate between the different types of data because uh, some data are created instantly you're clicking on a product you getting uh, information that this user is interested in this product right now and the thing is as soon as they made a purchase of another product this data is obsolete right they've already closed their purchase cycle and this is not relevant data anymore so it has a really uh, uh, low expiration date meaning that yeah it can be really relevant for a really short period of time and this is what i would call fast data fast data that's created fast expires really fast and uh, you know without third-party cookies even though it uh, they might not have bought something the data is lost as the third-party cookie is is reset and, and removed from the browser so you can't use this information anymore uh, and this is typically in the digital domain right where you're uh, creating a lot of uh, different events different digital signals that indicate user behavior uh, purchase window and so on right and then if we talk about statistical data or, or market segmentation then we're moving towards kind of the slow data the, the, that's reliable but it's not up, updated that frequently uh, but it's a very stable data set uh, and I think that this is where a lot of the, the power in the combination of first and third party data lies right where, where uh, you can combine the two the fast and the slow and of course you can also build uh, models on top of this combination right meaning that 
looking at things like seasonality. All right, what user behavior did we have on the website during this season last year versus uh, different customer segments? Meaning that, yeah, if we get this customer segment on the website next year by this time, we should have those and those offerings, right? So this is, uh, I think, uh, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about data enrichment. Because uh, this will allow you marketers to add more information to your first party data now that, that the data volumes in the third party services is going down. And I think that that's, uh, talking about this uh, first third party data, uh, it's really essential that we understand the reach um, uh, ramifications, right? Because if you're working with your first party data only, you're mostly working with your relational data, meaning that you will be good at serving those you already have a relationship with. But this data is really hard to use to kind of find new customers, right? And if you're going into uh, third party marketing channels where you're not able to, to match your customers, you're kind of having to rely on a large extent uh, a black box of information and uh, I think that that if you can create this bridge between the marketing side and the, the the first party data your customer data this is where the bridge and and I think the future lies uh, and uh, why I think it's so relevant with the data enrichment topic in general because uh, if you have uh, market data uh, or that's slow or even fast, meaning that now we can see a, a consumer group um, having this behavior and we can see the same behavior on the website. So without the third party cookie, we can actually start matching them. And if we also can match them um, like um, demographically and socioeconomically, then the bridge and the accuracy will be higher. But this means that actually advertisers and publishers will have to get better at their first party data and making sure that they actually can align and match each other. Because if it doesn't, you will be in the guesswork, right? And, and this is where I think most marketers have been for a very long time saying that, yeah, we, you have those customers, we think those websites are more relevant for you, even though you don't have it, uh, some, something really tangible to back it up. But if those websites can say, yeah, we have those consumers, those consumers, those consumers with this behavior right now and say, all right, it seems to match your user base, then we can start building this accuracy as well over time. But hey, we're jumping into data. And if we're looking at advertisers and marketers on the advertising side, they have been relying on simple technologies like the lookalikes because it's worked. And when those technologies are not as accurate anymore, it means actually taking control over your first party data and making sure that, that you understand which consumers are more relevant for you. And also actually validating that those consumers that you want to reach are actually those that are uh, driven to your website by your different marketing channels, marketing options, targeting options, and so on. So I think that, that, that uh, this is a huge opportunity for publishers and advertisers to really lock arms and come together. But with also the fragmentation of the programmatic ecosystem, this is a true challenge where I think data enrichment that's available on both sides can really act as, as a bridge for, uh, for marketing in general. And it's, of course, a huge task. This is like industry, I don't know, $500 billion annually projected to grow to $620 billion in 2026, I think. So the industry is huge. There's a lot of different platforms, but there's no real standard making this kind of connection without third party cookies really, really hard. But uh, I think that if, if advertisers seriously take a responsibility of getting to know their customers really, really well, and publishers making sure that they can provide this information in an integrity mindful way, where users opt into a specific publisher, 
the publisher works only with their first party data, enriches it and makes sure that it stays secure so that uh, internet users can trust you as a publisher, then you have a really, really good uh, setup to kind of have a, an integrity mindful, privacy safe uh, trust also in the digital marketing. Because even though we have this kind of um, awareness that that uh, data is everywhere a lot of players knows a lot about you and they're saying it's like if if you're not paying something then you're the commodity and i would say that that's true but on the other hand what's provided there's i think there's a flip side to this coin and that's if if uh, if you're not paying anything for something but you're getting value well, then if you're not paying with cash, maybe you need actually to pay with something else because, you know, recommendations, personalization, high relevance, uh, telling you not to drive down this road because it's blocked today and, and that's the road you usually take. You should probably take this one instead. That's not possible without actually sharing some kind of information. So it's like a, a, a two sides of the coin, right, where you don't want people to know something about it, you but if they don't know something about you, they can't serve you. So I think that if we can create an internet where, where trust in that the data is used responsibly, that the players that know something about you are, are res respectful of your privacy, but then we can also create great user experiences that, that serves the internet, that serves uh, businesses and internet users. So uh, I think that realizing that we live in a new reality where it's no longer the wild wild west when it comes to marketing data that it needs to be trusted structured and uh, mindful if we do this then i think that that we can really really create something uh, great going forward that's uh, more secure and more trusted and still works in a way that it serves uh, marketing marketers advertisers and publishers Thank you. Uh, looking forward to seeing you again. Uh, have a great day.